where you are. Thanks for joining us today for the, the Fish Insights uh, litigation webinar series. My name is John Singer, as, as you know from the introduction, and today Brian Caggio and I will discuss recent developments impacting Hatch-Waxman litigation. I'm a principal for, at Fish, and Brian is of counsel. For those of you who are interested, our biographies appear on the right uh, side, on the side of your screen. If you're joining one of these webinars for the first time, this series explores cases and trends and provides perspectives about key legal developments and litigation strategies across intellectual property, commercial, and white collar practice areas. <clears throat> and I apologize, I've got a little bit of cold, so I apologize for that. We're excited to have you here with us today and invite you to mark your calendars for our next meeting on April 15th when we'll talk about the current landscape for NPE litigation. The webinar will feature our colleagues Mike Rosen and Frank Schirkenbach, both the principals at FISH, and we hope you are able to join us. Today's webinar will run for about an hour and include a question and answer period at the end of the program. You may ask questions anytime throughout the program by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We'll do our best to answer them all at the end of the presentation time permitting. Please always feel free to contact us personally after the webinar if that's easier. Uh, before we get started, I should remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case uh, situation. Okay, with that little introduction, let's uh, show you what our agenda here is. We're going to dis discuss six topics. Brian and I will will uh, alter or, or hand off the baton to each of each other with each topic. The first topic we're going to talk about is personal jurisdiction in Hatch-Waxman litigation, which uh, was a boring topic for years until suddenly it has now become a very interesting topic. I'm going to first just go over uh, the prior framework. Uh, generally speaking, in Hatch-Waxman cases until about two or three years ago, a branded company could sue a generic company basically wherever that generic company did any kind of business. And I've cited one of the cases, uh, whoops, we, we got somehow ahead of ourselves. Um, and the consequences of that were that uh, Hatch-Waxman suits, while they were concentrated in New Jersey and Delaware, if the branded company wanted to sue somewhere else, it was relatively easy to establish jurisdiction. And it led to the rise of the Eastern District of Texas for some companies to, to use for potential personal jurisdiction. Uh, personal jurisdiction challenges were largely unsuccessful, and there was never really a need to resort to doctrines of specific uh, personal jurisdiction. The Supreme Court has come out with a couple rulings in the last few years that have changed the landscape potentially um, for that uh, old rubric. These two decisions, um, which you should familiarize yourself if you're a practitioner in the area, generally speaking, described and tried to narrow the universe of general jurisdiction such that uh, corporations would only be able to be sued generally for any tort, and that's what general jurisdiction is, in jurisdictions where they were, quote, at home. And there's uh, uh, some, some dicta or, depending on your point of view, binding language in these decisions that says people are at home only, or corporations are at home only where they are registered to do business, excuse me, where they are incorporated to do business, and where their principal place of business is. Okay, so that's the, the general jurisdiction cases that I've listed here, the Goodyear and Daimler cases. There have also been, uh, there also was one specific jurisdiction case which didn't get as much play in the, in the press, uh, but is also very important. Previously, Calder versus Jones established the kind of framework for specific jurisdiction for a out-of-state tort which had effects in state. So an and a filing out of state in Maryland or wherever, uh, that had effect on a resident of the state. Uh, say a resident here, I'm in Minnesota. If a drug company is in Minnesota, they could say that that uh, and a filing had effect in Minnesota. In Walden versus Fiore in 2014, the Supreme Court appeared to limit Calder versus Jones and said that you should not be focusing on where the plaintiff is, but rather that the focus in a specific jurisdiction inquiry still must be on the defendant and what the defendant has done to create contacts with the state. And that haphazard contacts with the state don't count. The defendant has to have directed his or her conduct to the state and not merely injured the plaintiff who happens to reside in the state. All right, what has that led to? So you have a bunch of uh, decisions about personal jurisdiction suddenly. What was a, 
a dead issue, if you will, in Hatch-Waxman cases now is a very live one. Um, Mylan, uh, the big generic company in uh, West Virginia, has been particularly aggressive in challenging personal jurisdiction. It's, it's, I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine they would like to litigate in West Virginia, where they're located. And they have, they have um, embarked on a series of challenges to cases in Delaware. I've listed three decisions here that have come out at the end of last year and the beginning of this year. There was another one yesterday uh, from Judge Andrews. And basically what these decisions say is that the old rubric is dead, that just basing jurisdiction on sales is um, not going to work. So Myland's sales of other products isn't going to be a, a basis for jurisdiction. And then I've gone two different ways in terms of finding jurisdiction. In the AstraZeneca case, Judge Sleet rejected general jurisdiction based on consent. And by that, I mean where somebody registers to do business and consents to general jurisdiction, but instead found specific jurisdiction based on the sending of the paragraph four to AstraZeneca in Delaware. In Accorda and Forrest, both Judges Stark and Bur Magistrate Judge Burke found uh, general jurisdiction based on consent. And Judge Andrews yesterday did the same thing. Uh, the first two cases are up on interlocutory appeal, and the AstraZeneca one, number one, was accepted for appeal by the Federal Circuit uh, yesterday. There's also been one in Texas in front of Judge Gilstrap, the very busy judge in Marshall, and he sidestepped the issue of general jurisdiction, not ruling one way or the other, either on consent or on Daimler's uh, on sales or the like, and found specific jurisdiction based on the defendant's presence in the state and the plaintiff's presence in the state. Uh, notably, the paragraph four was not sent to Texas, but the plaintiff had the manufacturing facility and the employees for the product at issue in Texas. And Judge Gilstrap found that the plaintiff would be harmed in Texas from the defendant's presence in Texas, i.e. the defendant's generic infrastructure, if you will, all the sales contracts that the generic would sign and those that had been signed in the past. Importantly, Judge Gilstrap assessed future harm given the nature of the Hatch-Waxman case, which is a future inquiry, and it's a really an interesting uh, decision to read, taking a different tack than the judges in Delaware. <clears throat> it raises a lot of questions uh, that maybe some of these are things that you folks um, uh, would like to have discussed later on, and feel free to, um, to, to, to put some forward. I think the last two are really interesting, and we'll have to wait the Federal Circuit's uh, review of the decision it has now. And that is, will, will people react to this by changing states of incorporations and, and presumably uh, not principal places of business um, to try to affect a more favorable uh, jurisdiction for them, as, in, as the case may be, for lawsuits? And will branded patentees change behaviors? Will they set up, you know, could they set up a subsidiary, for example, simply to receive paragraph fours uh, in whatever jurisdiction it is they would like to do that? All right, so this is a hot issue. As I said, the Fed Circuit accepted uh, uh, the AstraZeneca versus Mylan case yesterday and will await uh, the outcome of that case. We'll all follow it eagerly. I would expect it would take six months, uh, six to eight months to resolve. Okay, Brian, take it away for the next topic. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, my first topic uh, has to do with the good faith belief in invalidity as a defense to inducement of infringement. Uh, you'll see the slides accompanying my three topics are admittedly busy, but this was intentional as the slides contain background information on each topic and include citations to the relevant decisions and statutes that I will be discussing. So my first topic, as I said, is inducement of infringement and the Federal Circuit's recent decision in Camille v. Cisco, which will be argued before the Supreme Court on 331. It's not a Hatch-Waxman case, but at least one court has suggested that the good faith defense to inducement would apply to such cases, and this topic is certainly important in the life sciences area. First, some necessary background. In DSU v. JMS, the Federal Circuit in 2006, en banc, held that inducement of infringement required a, quote, specific intent to infringe. Merely inducing the conduct later found to infringe was not sufficient. In this case, the court settled an intra-circuit split between the decisions in a Hewlett-Packard case and a Manville case. The Federal Circuit did not state how this super intent could be established, but it did tell us how it could be negated. If the defendant has a good faith belief that the induced conduct did not infringe, the defendant may not be liable for inducement. 
Direct infringement is, of course, different, and my discussion today, just so there's no confusion, is limited to inducement. This good faith defense is significant in life sciences, as you all know, because actions for infringement of method of use, method of, treat pat method of treatment patents are brought under Section 271B. Also, in vivo conversion cases are brought under that section. This defense negates liability even if the defendant is proven wrong while the defendant has this so-called good faith belief. The Camille decision and the facts you can see I have set out here in the slide extended the good faith defense, as I call it, to include a good faith belief in invalidity. In so doing, the court relied heavily on the Supreme Court's 2011 decision in Global Tech. The case actually focused on the knowledge of, knowledge of the patent in suit by the inducer. But the Federal Circuit interpreted that case as requiring the defendant to know of the patent in suit and also know that the induced conduct actually infringed the patent in suit. Since knowledge of the actual infringement was a requirement, if the defendant had a good faith belief in invalidity, it, would, it couldn't believe that it was actually infringing because according to the majority, an invalid patent cannot be infringed. So after Camille, a good faith belief in non-infringement or invalidity negates the specific intent required under 271B. The dissent by Newman, Judge Newman, and judges who dissented in the denial of the rehearing on Bonk argued that an invalid patent can be infringed, but no liability attaches. Move to slide two. Uh, the good faith defense is best established by a written opinion of counsel, but in certain cases, testimony alone is sufficient. The slide here collects various cases showing the significance of what I'm calling the good faith defense to inducement. Defense often resulted in the finding of no infringement or in the denial of a summary judgment motion brought by the patentee. But like most things in life, timing is everything. If you're going to rely on this opinion, make sure you have it before the case begins. Significantly, by statute, the lack of an opinion now is not admissible regarding willfulness or inducement. Okay, let's return to the Supreme Court. In the third petition, Camille limited its attack to the use of invalidity opinions. And basically, its arguments tracked that that we see uh, uh, by the dissent in the Federal Circuit. Response, Cisco again argued that an invalid patent couldn't be infringed and thus a specific intent to induce infringement couldn't be present uh, so there's no inducement. Here's where it gets interesting. In the amicus brief supporting the grant of solicitor, granting the, supporting the grant of cert, the solicitor general agreed with Camille that the new defense was improper. It cited an article that I had written and stated that Global Tech, and I want to quote, does not clearly resolve whether the defendant must possess actual knowledge that the induced conduct constitutes infringement. The Solicitor General then questioned the DSU holding, but noted that no party had challenged that decision. Significantly, if the defendant need not know that its conduct actually infringed, its good faith belief in non-infringement or invalidity becomes irrelevant, and this defense ceases to exist. Moving to the next slide, uh, in its merits brief, now Camille adopted the solicitor's position and it argued that the good faith defense, invalidity or non-infringement, is improper and should be abolished. At a minimum, the good faith defense, the good faith invalidity defense should not exist. Cisco in its papers disputed these arguments, including Camille's reading of global tech, and again argued that an invalid patent cannot be infringed. In the next slide, we see that in its amicus brief on the merits, the Solicitor General flatly stated that Section 271B does not require knowledge of the infringing nature of the induced act, and if a good faith belief in non and a good faith belief in non-infringement is not a defense to inducement liability. The Solicitor General continued that at a minimum, the good faith invalidity defense is improper. The Solicitor General significantly cited the Supreme Court's so-called Arrow 2 decision, st 
stating that it struck an appropriate balance between the rights of the patent holders and the protection of truly innocent induces. In Arrow, inducement was found because the defendant knew about the patent in suit and realized that the patentee considered the induced conduct to be infringing. That was enough to satisfy the intent requirement. Uh, as we see, the AIPLA, the IPO, Bio and Pharma all agree with Camille that the good faith invalidity defense is wrong and should be abolished, but none of them attack the good faith defense as a whole. So in summary, when you read all the briefs and articles, it would appear that the Camille decision will be reversed. Again, this is one person's opinion, and that a good faith belief in invalidity will not negate the specific intent required. A timely infringement opinion, however, may still assist an alleged infringer in negating the intent requirement. However, the Supreme Court may revisit its global tech decision, reevaluate the good faith defense as a whole, as Camille and the government argue in their merits brief. Much may depend on what the court is persuaded by. It is quite possible, however, that the court could eliminate the good faith defense in its entirety. Again, argument is set for March 31st of this year, and then we'll see if this defense or any part of it survives. John? All right. Thanks, Brian. Let's move forward now to um, obviousness, everybody's favorite topic. We're eight years on from, from KSR, and the Federal Circuit uh, continues to struggle with how to apply that ruling. And we've we picked the Barraclude decision because it's gotten a lot of attention, primarily because of the nature of the patent that was invalidated. And of course, the Barraclude decision relates to an NCE, a new chemical entity uh, for treating uh, the disease hepatitis B. And it was invalidated as, obviously, a, a uh, very important treatment uh, that now has no patent protection, although there is, of course, always the possibility that the Supreme Court will grant certiorari, unlikely. Uh, the certiorari petition was uh, only recently filed uh, and full disclosure, um, uh, my firm prepared an amicus brief uh, in that uh, proceeding. A little background on the uh, decision itself. Um, as I said, it's the hepatitis B drug, Baraclude, uh, and Tesevere is obvious, and there's a bunch of opinions uh, that you can read. And here on the next slide, we kind of show uh, sort of uh, the, if you will, the simplistic view that um, oftentimes when you're considering these decision uh, reigns. And you can see um, the, the claimed compound and the prior art lead compound uh, differ at the position that we've circled on the, uh, the pentagonal ring there. Um, critically, if you see the second bullet point, post-invention in vivo studies revealed it was toxic. Okay? Um, while researchers were using it as a lead and it was efficacious uh, and viewed it as promising, they learned afterwards uh, that after they had invented the compound at top, uh, that it was highly toxic and it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't, of course, be something that could be used in treatment. Um, the uh, panel's rationale essentially just said it was based on uh, a lot of testimony. And one thing that's a little bit underplayed about that case is the, the, the generic lawyer did an excellent job of cross-examining uh, the witness for BMS and really got, him, uh, got that expert to admit to a lot of things. And, and you'll see that strain in these opinions that this was driven by actually the record in the case and not any desire to change uh, the rules on law. But nonetheless, um, what the ruling um, ended up saying, the majority ruling, uh, was that that difference in toxicity, which you might expect would play a key role in the obviousness analysis, was irrelevant uh, because it was unknown at the time of the invention. Um, as you can see, they said it was obvious to select that as a lead because the expert had admitted it. It was obvious to modify it to arrive at antesevere, um, and any unexpected results were either just a difference in degree, i.e., a little more efficacious than the prior, uh, the lead compound, um, and the difference in toxicity, I guess, too late, essentially. You didn't learn about that. It didn't subjectively motivate the inventor, so therefore, objectively, we shouldn't look at it uh, in the inquiry. That's according to the rationale. Um, there's a variety of point of views uh, on that critical issue. And that really is what they were fighting about. If you think about it, the whole obvious at the time the invention was made is, is going to be an anachronism now with the AIA, of course, with the first to first two, uh, file rule. You have to be obvious at the time of filing now. 
But, uh, of course, post-filing evidence will still uh, be brought to bear. So I, it's my view that that's what these people were fighting about, what the world will be like post-AIA. And you can see Judge Dyke, post-invention evidence never relevant because 103 requires the injury to inquiry to be conducted at the time of the invention. And, of course, post-AIA at the, after the effective filing date. Uh, Judge O'Malley was uh, more driven by the evidence that I described. The expert really did admit a lot of things uh, in, upon cross-examination, but agreed with the dissent that the obviousness inquiry needs to be driven by all the evidence. Since it's a hypothetical uh, inquiry, we ought to consider hypothetically all the evidence, no artificial uh, sort of timelines in, in the rule. And Judge Newman's dissent, you know, very vigorous of, about that, that this bright line rule that the uh, panel adopted is uh, erroneous with respect to differences in degree and differences in kind, and also with respect to the uh, timing issue. Judge Toronto also got a long, uh, lengthy dissent uh, that the full court should also analyze how to define reasonable expectation uh, of, su of success. What is reasonable? What is success? These are really nettlesome and difficult issues for those of you who, who might have had experience arguing before the federal circuit or even to a district court, figuring out what the reasonable expectation of success, it's really, really in the eye of the beholder. Uh, you know, some one person's uh, reasonable expectation of success is another person's unreasonable. And uh, Judge Toronto also agrees that post-invention uh, evidence is not prohibited uh, by the text of Section uh, 103 and can fit it in depending on how you define reasonable expectation. Okay, so really the, what I'd like just to focus for a minute or two on is the consequences and questions that, that come out of this decision as opposed to really the, the facts. I think the, the potential for Supreme Court view is I think most people regard as, as very low um, and I think we've heard the last word on this case, but of course not the last word in future cases. Um, it, you know, is it right to restrict analysis to time of invention? And this is an anachronistic question because of AIA, but of course we'll be dealing with a lot of non-AIA patents for quite a long time. Uh, litigators, as litigators, we always are looking backwards and litigating yesterday's technology uh, for the most part. Um, you know, prior art, I've always wondered about this, that prior art is not restricted to time of invention, right? You you have prior art up to, for 102B, uh, one year um, before the filing as an absolute um, uh, requirement. You can't swear behind that. And so prior art's not restricted to the time of invention. Why should other evidence be restricted to the time of invention? And I think it, if you really think about it, I think it makes the inquiry somewhat uh, subjective um, because if something wasn't known uh, at the time of the invention, it's not that it, it didn't exist. <laughs> Those, it's just that someone hadn't discovered it yet. And it, it seems contrary to sort of the objective, all the evidence available uh, point of view that you consider an obvious. Lots of things the inventor didn't know about uh, and our prior art get thrown, thrown at the invention. And why should the good stuff be excluded in some artificial role? At least that's my uh, point of view. And, of course, I, I throw these questions out. What if inventor doesn't know, but others do, vice versa? Of course, that doesn't matter, right? The case law says what the inventor knew uh, doesn't matter, um, and what others know and what the field knows does matter. Um, so I think this is a little bit inconsistent, and we'll have to see how it plays out. Uh, obviously, a, a very fractured court uh, on this issue. And then there's this differences in degree versus differences in kind. For those of you who have been involved in litigating <coughs> Um, not NCE patents, so formulation patents, for example, you see this all the time. I mean, that's, that's what formulation patents are typically based on, that they've improved some property, right, of a prior, typically NCE, um, uh, protected molecule. Uh, they, you know, the simplest example might be uh, an extended release. Uh, but other, there are plenty of other examples uh, about a difference in degree versus difference in kind supporting uh, patentability. And, you know, I ask, is there really anything to this distinction? You know, my, my view is it's just a very uh, pithy is the word I used, way to summarize um, kind of what we all know, that something, you know, if you have a, um, a drug that has an effect on uh, one part of the body and, and no one thinks it'll have an effect on another and then someone discovers that it does, that difference in kind is, is just more surprising. 
whereas if you make something more effective, that might not be uh, more surprising. It, it could be, though. And, and so I think, from my perspective, I think it's dangerous to categorize things in this fashion, and I put the law of unintended consequences there. Undoubtedly, you will then uh, confuse people trying to apply the law that a difference in degree is deserving of less um, merit than a difference in kind, no matter how big the difference in degree might be. So I, I, I think that this is a dangerous path to go down to make these distinctions. I think it's really just a, as I said, a clever way to summarize and categorize what we all know, that some differences are more surprising uh, than others. And I hope that the court will back away from this kind of rigid distinction between differences in degree and differences in kind. Okay, Brian, take it away for the next topic. Okay, thank you, John. The next topic deals drug labels as inducing infringement. Uh, I'm going to use the term drug labels uh, generically to cover labels, package inserts, and instruction for use. So the first thing we do is return to DSU, where we learned that a specific intent to infringe is required to establish a claim for inducement. Unfortunately, the Federal Circuit provided little, if any, guidance on what a specific intent is or how to establish it. However, in our area, pharmaceuticals, drug labels by themselves will often determine whether a specific intent to infringe exists or not, and thus whether infringement under 271B exists. First, some general background about drug labels and inducement. The cases illustrate the following. Obtaining an AB rating, which allows, of course, direct substitution of the generic for the brand, by itself will not satisfy the intent requirement for inducement. Off-label uses cannot be the subject of an inducement claim because such uses cannot be advocated, thus induced. This would be true even if the off-label uses are significant. Lastly, substantial non-infringing uses can undercut an inducement claim. But even if they exist, the label still controls and inducement is still possible. Where the non-infringing uses, the cases indicate, far outweigh the infringing uses, the patentee may indeed have a proof problem. Takes a while for these slides to get changed. Okay, the high point, depending upon your view of drug labels and inducement, is the statement, the District of New Jersey, that statements in a package insert that encourage infringing use of a drug are alone sufficient to establish an intent to encourage direct infringement. The first of the three cases I'd like to discuss in detail is AstraZeneca v. Apotex, a decision emanating from the District of New Jersey. I'd like to add that the three cases I will be discussing have complex facts, and I've attempted to simplify them uh, during my discussion due to time constraints, and hopefully I didn't omit too much. In Astra, the patent claimed a specific dosage range. The generics label did not specify the claimed dosage range. So at first blush, one might have concluded that inducement didn't exist. The label, however, specified a starting dosage, which was above the claimed dosage, and contained repeated statements in the dosage and administration and precautions sections that instructed that the starting dosage should be titrated down to the lowest effective dose. The Federal Circuit affirmed this court's decision that this downward titration would result in uses, not all uses, but uses within the claimed ranges, and therefore inducement of infringement existed. Apotex's argument that the FDA, in essence, forced it to use the particular wording was rejected. According to the Federal Circuit, Apotex should have appealed the FDA decision on the labeling, the labeling or get this, filed a paragraph three certification. Thus, from Astra, we see how the drug was actually used in the real, in the real world was determinative. But how the drug was being used here was influenced by the recommendations in the label. 
The next case I'd like to turn to, waiting for the slide, is Bayer v. Sandoz. That was decided by the Federal Circuit in 2012. There, Bayer's patent claimed the use of a particular drug to treat three separate conditions. Bayer's drug label, however, specified the use of the drug to treat only one of those three conditions. The other two were mentioned. So the generic copies, copied Bayer's label, and uh, unfortunately, we'll see Bayer created its own problem. Here, the Federal Circuit affirmed the lower court decision of no inducement for, for reasons that included the label did not indicate that all three uses were safe and effective. The single approved use was found in the indication and usage section that controlled, even though other sections, the clinical pharmacology section, indicated that the drug may have properties that indeed treated these other two conditions. Since the drug was approved for only one use, one of the three, the other two uses were akin to off-label uses and inducement wouldn't lie for such uses. Judge Newman's dissent is interesting because according to her, when the drug was administered, all three conditions were treated. So the actual real war world use of the drug, unlike Astra, did not control because the label did not recommend using the drug to treat the other two conditions. Uh, this decision, as you could guess, highlights the importance of coordination between the relevant patent and the drug label itself. Waiting, the last decision is a district court decision. It's now on appeal to the Federal Circuit, emanates from New Jersey as well. There, the patent in suit required the use of a specific diluent, which reduced the possibility of infection. The generic label did not contain a specific instruction or direction to use that diluent. Numerous sections in that label, though, including the warnings and precautions section, stressed the possibility of infection. Here, the patentee argued that this warning was sufficient to lead physicians to search the literature and learn about dilution and its effect on safety. And thus, after putting it all together, the physician would practice the claimed invention. The district court ruled for Sandoz and noted the clear distinction between an instruction on use and a warning. Instructions must be such that a court can infer from the instruction an affirmative intent to infringe. The inducement claim here, I think, was a bit tenuous, but the case confirms the Astra ruling that the language of the label is all important. So what do we take away from these cases? Uh, I think we all agree that NDA holders should draft their labels to mimic claims or at least some claims. Uh, you have to negotiate with the FDA to arrive at a label uh, if you're a brand that matches uh, the uh, patent claims, it may be difficult, uh, but remember any excuses that the FDA made me do it, they're not going to hold water if you're a brand or a generic. So with that in mind, I turn it back to John. Thanks, Brian. For uh, my last topic, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some an a recent antitrust ruling from the Federal Circuit. Um, and this is the Tyco decision about sham litigation as well as a sham citizens petition. Uh, for those of you um, <coughs> in the pharmaceutical industry listening, as you know, uh, the pharmaceutical industry is under increasing attack for antitrust theories. And here is another a theory uh, that the Federal Circuit has uh, now blessed uh, that will undoubtedly be the subject both of uh, generic applicants' challenge but also uh, private plaintiff challenges as well. Just a little bit of uh, background, uh, if we go to the, whoops, let me click the button to get to the next slide here. Um, uh, this is the citation for you. As I said, it reverses summary judgment of no sham litigation and reverse summary judgment of no sham litigation for the FDA citizens petition. I'm going to read here the New York CLE code. For those of you in New York, it is 318. That is New York CLE code 318. Okay. Um, in the case... Uh, the, here's the, the general two-part test uh, for sham litigation. 
And typically, you have to have a very high hurdle here. The litigation is objectively baseless in the sense that no reasonable litigant could reasonably expect success on the merits, and the litigation is motivated by a desire to interfere directly with the business relationships of a competitor. So this is both <clears throat> excuse me, an objective and a subjective test. And it's fair to say that this decision actually focused on the objective test uh, for the um, uh, for the litigation side, and a lot of what was on the citizen petition side had to do with the subjective test. But that is the test that is applied both now to litigation and to citizens' petitions. Uh, it was a little unclear whether it applied to citizens' petitions, uh, but the Federal Circuit ruled uh, that, it, that it is. Um, so on the litigation side, this is some general uh, background. Um, the, the, the real issue, I think there's really two issues here, is that the, the ability to run a test and what is an appropriate test is a classic issue of um, credibility at the district court. And I think it was interesting here that the patent required a particular drug uh, formulation. Uh, the ANDA reported a non-infringing value, and the patentee relied on test data at a, a different temperature. I think the difference was 40 degrees centigrade and 100 degrees centigrade. And the, the interesting part is that fourth bullet. It says the mere fact that the ANDA suggested non-infringement was not itself enough for antitrust liability. And the Federal Circuit actually agreed uh, with Tyco that it's not unreasonable. This is, this is an important finding. For a patent owner to allege infringement under Section 271E2A, if the patent owner has evidence that the as-marketed commercial ANDA product will infringe, even though the hypothetical product specified in the ANDA could not infringe. And that's at page 10 of the decision. This is that constant tension we see in Hatch-Waxman cases between what the ANDA might say and what might actually happen in the real world when that product is out in the marketplace. The Federal Circuit's got a lot of decisions that actually sort of say the opposite of this, that if the ANDA resolves something and says something's not infringing, that's it. You know, the generic applicant has to follow that, and if they make something that is uh, outside that specification, they're breaking the law. And in the, in the hypothetical inquiry, you shouldn't be assuming that the generic applicant will break the law. This decision, however, says that that is a reasonable course of action, provided you actually have the evidence. And that was the, the flaw here in Tyco's uh, position. They didn't have the evidence for infringement, and so the Federal Circuit reversed the district court's finding that, um, that, uh, that the, uh, there could be no possibility of sham litigation and remanded for the district court to further consider this temperature difference. Was the use of the higher temperature uh, reasonable by Tyco? Uh, or was it unreasonable? And was it a, a you know just trying to rig the rig the test, if you will? Okay. Uh, turning to the the citizens' petition, the the important holding is that the same two part test applies to sham litigation. Um, uh, that applies to sham litigation also applies to sham uh, FDA filings. And here, you know, <laughs> the the question of whether or not something was objectively basis was was based in large part on the FDA's. Uh, findings. Uh, the Federal Circuit did note the generic experts saying that the patentee had no scientific basis to challenge bioequivalence. That was what the petition was about. But I, I would say that if you read the decision, uh, you can conclude that the Federal Circuit was impressed by what the FDA had to say about the citizen's petition. There's a lengthy quotes from the FDA's decision on the citizen's petition. And then, of course, there's also fact issues on whether CP was filed in, in bad faith, the subjective prong. The timing of the CP, I mean, this looks terrible, right? Filed the day after the district court found non-infringement. I mean, if you really think this product is bad and it's not bioequivalent, and it's not safe, you know, that timing is, I think, any court is going to find that that is troubling. Uh, it looks like uh, an effort to delay. It's not dispositive. And discovery should be taken. There might be another explanation, but I, I assume, uh, and you can read for yourself in the decision, that that drove uh, this um, this part of the re reversal, and I don't I don't think that this is all that um, critical. The patentee's internal email said it was possible to make a non-infringing but bioequivalent product. You know that I think would not have been that big a deal had they filed the citizens' petition earlier, such that it didn't look like it was simply meant to delay approval. <clears throat> so again, we have some 
sort of consequences and questions. And I, I pose one on the infringement side. How realistic is the analysis on the infringement side? And I actually think it was, it was fair. Um, the, the Newman's dissent takes issue with the notion that there should ever be sham litigation in the Hatch-Waxman process. And I think what she's really articulating or worried about is, well, the, the whole Hatch-Waxman statute envisions litigation. So what's the big deal here? That's the whole point. If you're the generic filer, heck, you want to get a finding of non-infringement to, to uh, affect 180-day exclusivity, for example. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's doctrinally a very strong argument. It is patent litigation, and it ought to be uh, consistent and treated consistently with other uh, patent litigation just as an available doctrine. I will say, I think what she's articulating has some merit. Oftentimes, hatch from cases are filed without a whole lot of knowledge on the plaintiff's side. Uh, it's oftentimes difficult to get information uh, ahead of time from a generic filer, and even if you can get it. Um, you often are restricted in how you can use it. So I think a sliding scale here is what will come out of it. Uh, and I think Newman's dissent makes a point uh, that should be taken seriously, but I think it can be handled uh, by the courts. Um, oh, uh, one other thing that I didn't put in the slides, the, the Federal Circuit also rejected uh, the notion that the Tyco wasn't allowed to rely on the presumption of validity on the validity side. They rejected that argument. The citizen petition side I find a little more troubling. I, I, the timing, I don't have a problem with that. I think that timing is a factor there. If you have a citizen's petition and you file it the day after a non-infringing ruling, you know, there's potentially an inference there that uh, what you did was to delay. Um, but, you know, the focus on the FDA's review, while it sounds uh, for better or for sexy, if you will, is it really fair to do that? I mean, the FDA is not subject to any kind of discovery. And to space a, a finding of objective baselessness based on a government agency determination where you can't really get behind the government agency's determination is troubling. Um, it puts in the hands of a third party who uh, may or may not have an interest in generic approval, depending on, on the situation, uh, sort of this ultimate decision of whether or not a citizen's petition is uh, filed in bad faith or is really objectively baseless. So I'm, I'm hopeful that people will recognize that that issue as we go forward. Hopefully there won't be too many of these decisions and people won't be filing um, sham citizens petitions. But, you know, FDA citizens petitions, the number that are granted are very few. Uh, and so I worry uh, that this kind of decision could be taken uh, by those who would attack the pharmaceutical industry and say that every time a citizen's petition is denied, uh, that there's a basis for sham litigation and a claim for antitrust. Um, Brian, why don't you take it away for our last topic? Brian, are you on mute? Did you mute yourself? No, something was wrong with my phone. IPRs and potential impact on Hatch-Waxman litigation. Uh, I have focused here on two areas of concern. Uh, the possible effect of an IPR decision on the 30-month stay of FDA approval and the failure to market forfeiture provision. As to the latter, I focus just on a what I call the triggering event of that provision and not other relevant aspects because, as many or most of you know, this forfeiture procedure is uh, very, very complex. As this slide indicates, the 30-month stay of FDA approval ends with a district court judgment of invalidity or not infringement. An appeal does not delay the end of that period. Thus, the entry of the DC judgment is what I call the triggering event. What the generic loses at the district court but prevails on appeal on invalidity or not infringement. The 30 month stay then ends with the, this, the appellate court's decision. Is, we don't know if the entry of a judgment is required or is the triggering event the decision itself. And as many of you will know, uh, that could be very crucial depending upon the lag between the decision and the entry of the judgment by the appellate court. The 180-day exclusivity is forfeited when the NDA owner fails to market the drug within 75 days after a decision of the appellate court on invalidity or non-infringement. 
The district court in this case, the district court's judgment does not start what I'm calling the 75-day clock. So here the triggering event is the appellate decision, even if the generic one below. Now the statutes we've been looking at or I've been discussing, referenced in the slides, indicate that the judgment or decision must emanate from an infringement or a declaratory judgment action. So the question arises, how will a decision in an IPR, even if appealed to the federal circuit and affirmed, affect these two time periods? First, we'll look at the 30-month stay. If the PTAB holds that the patent's invalid, this probably has no effect. But the generic could take that decision and move for summary judgment of invalidity in a pending Hatch-Waxman case, assuming that it hadn't been stayed. If the suit had not yet been filed, a generic could possibly file a DJ action. If the district court enters judgment, the 30-month stay expires. The different standards applied by the courts and the PTO in a typical re-exam were not a concern to the Federal Circuit in deciding the effect of a PTO decision in validating a patent when it was affirmed by the DC, when it was affirmed by the Federal Circuit on a pending district court litigation. We see that in the Fresenius decision in which, is, in which Fish's own Juanita Brooks prevailed. Now, that the, now, however, the brand might argue that since the PTAB decision is on appeal, which is likely to happen, summary judgment is inappropriate or any decision on the motion should be stayed. This sounds quite reasonable. However, the statute specifically uses a district court judgment as a triggering event. And since a key purpose of the Hatch-Waxman Act is to get generics to market quickly, a counter-argument exists that the district court should rule on the motion promptly. If the district court grants summary judgment of invalidity, the 75-day forfeiture period does not begin to run until the appeal is decided. But what if the Federal Circuit affirms the PTAB invalidity holding? Does the 75-day period need to wait until the Federal Circuit decides the appeal from the infringement action? even if that appeal might be frivolous because the patent has already been declared invalid by the Federal Circuit. But without that second decision of the Federal Circuit, it is possible that no triggering event would ever occur. But if the generic succeeds in the PTAB appeal and returns to the district court entry of a judgment, some have questioned whether a case or contrary case or controversy even exists? Should the case be dismissed without a ruling on invalidity because the Federal Circuit has already held the patent invalid? This could possibly eliminate a triggering event for forfeiture because under this statute, a decision of invalidity or non-infringement is required for forfeiture. A triggering event for the 30-month stay is a mere dismissal of the action. I want to discuss for a minute this recent E-plus decision and how, at least in my opinion, it could bear on this question. It's important to this discussion that the 30-month stay be viewed as equitable in nature, a la an injunction, as it prevents the FDA from approving a drug. The forfeiture provision voids the 180-day exclusivity as to the first generic filer and removes the prohibition and allows the FDA to approve a later filed ANDA. So in a sense, it has the characteristics of an injunction. In E+, a patent had been held valid and infringed by the Federal Circuit, but the case was remanded to the district court for a minor modification to the injunction, which had previously been entered by the court. In the interim, the Federal Circuit affirmed a PTO re-examination ruling that the patent was invalid. On the second appeal from the D.C. action, the district court action, the Federal Circuit vacated the injunction because, quote, it is well established that an injunction must be set aside when the legal basis for it has ceased to exist. Once the PTO's decision was affirmed, according to the Federal Circuit, the patent, quote, no longer conferred any rights that support an injunction against infringement. Now, I realize that the statutes that I've been speaking about, the 180-day exclusivity forfeiture and the 30-day stay statute, uh, require 
uh, decisions emanating from a district court action or a declaratory judgment action. But in light of E+, plus and the wording of the Federal Circuit decision, assume a PTAB decision of invalidity is affirmed by the Federal Circuit. Does the 30-month injunction preventing the FDA automatically terminate because the patent no longer confers any rights that support an injunction? Does the 75-day triggering event for forfeiture begin? Recall that both events are triggered by the Federal Circuit decision. Of course, I realize that the Federal Circuit's affirmance of the PTAB decision doesn't emanate from an infringement or declaratory judgment action. But does one have to take those decisions, run back to the district court, and start, in a sense, motion practice in order to secure a judgment of the district court, which then would be appealed to the Federal Circuit to begin the forfeiture period, the 75-day forfeiture, or end with the district court judgment, the uh, 30-month stay of approval. The very last slide here just collects some information as to what is required for finality. We know from Fresenius, once a patent is canceled after the appeal of a PTO decision, a pending district court action must be dismissed. In the Hatch-Waxman context, however, is a certificate from the PTO canceling the claims necessary to trigger a forfeiture in the Hatch-Waxman action or the end of the 30-month stay. Recall that a triggering event was an appellate decision or a district court judgment. So we have to see what's going to play out in these decisions. Unfortunately, we have nothing to guide us with, and my comments on the E-plus decision and its effect are just possibilities, which may or may not come to be. John? All right. Thanks, Brian. This is obviously a very uh, unsettled area, uh, and, and uh, uh, it raises a lot of questions about um, the IPR process and Hatch-Waxman litigation. Folks, if you have uh, some questions, feel free to type them in. We've gotten a, a couple that uh, I will pose, both of them for Brian. Um, first, uh, as I said, you can always contact us afterwards, if you'd like, by email. I'm at singer at fr.com and brian's at cagio at fr.com. Okay, Brian, question number one uh, from the audience is, for there to be inducement based on the current state of the law, does it require inducer's knowledge of the existence of a patent? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> and by that I mean in the global tech case, the Supreme Court required that the defendant, the inducer, know about the patent in suit or be what the Supreme Court called willfully blind. In that case, the defendant copied the patentee's product. Uh, the product was not marked with the patent number. Then the defendant retained the lawyer to do a search to see if the product was covered by anyone's patent. The uh, defendant did not tell the lawyer that he had copied the plaintiff's patented or didn't know plaintiff's product. Uh, so the lawyer did a search, didn't uncover the patent in suit, uh, and then when the suit was filed by the patentee, the defendant claimed, hey, I didn't know about this patent. How could I be liable for inducement? The Supreme Court said, tough luck. You were willfully blind in not learning about the patent and not providing the information you had to your attorney. Maybe that would have changed matters. He might have then found the patent. So even though the defendant did not, quote, unquote, know about the patent in suit, it was still held liable for inducement. Yeah, interesting. Brian, I'll ask you, how do you think the uh, Supreme Court will rule? In the Camille case? Yes, in the Camille case. I would think, based upon the articles I've read and the briefs by you know, these organizations, that the uh, invalidity good faith defense is going out the window. Uh, I don't know if the Supreme Court is going to go further and do away with the entire uh, good faith defense as it applies to both infringement and invalidity. And if it does remain, at least as to non-infringement, the good faith belief in non-infringement a la DSU, uh, 
I would refer you to the cases in, on the, that I've gathered on one of the slides showing how effective that particular defense can be. Usually when a defense fails, or almost always when it fails, it's because the defendant obtained an opinion of counsel after the suit began. And in one case, the district court actually said such opinions are worth little, if anything. All right. Okay, we had a question about the uh, Judge Andrews decision in, in personal jurisdiction. It was AstraZeneca versus Mylan, and there's actually two issues there. There's Mylan Labs and Mylan Inc. Uh, the decision just came out uh, yesterday. You can uh, you can hopefully find it shortly on uh, the court's website. And again, I was asked to mention the New York CLE code is 318. Uh, Brian, another question for you. Um, I guess this is really for both of us, really. How common are IPRs in the Hatch-Waxman context? Are IPR filers seeking stays of the parallel litigation, and how successful would that be? Let me give my view, and then, Brian, why don't you give yours? They are becoming uh, more common. Uh, let me leave it at that. Both, both in the context of the actual litigation, um, where uh, a paragraph four second filer, if you will, right, someone who doesn't hold the exclusivity, uh, will either file an IPR or threaten to file an IPR uh, to try and negotiate a settlement. Um, and as far as the stays go, I have not seen um, a successful stay of a Hatch-Waxman uh, case. I, I can't know uh, whether uh, how many have been filed, because that was the question, are IPR filers seeking stays? But of course, if, if you stayed the Hatch-Waxman litigation, it would operate to the great prejudice of the branded company because, of course, the 30-month stay um, is uh, only 30 months. So I think the, the Hatch-Waxman litigation, because of its unique context, will not see uh, a lot of stays uh, absent, some, um, absent some agreement uh, by the litigants that the stay would be lengthened. So, for example, uh, if the litigant who moved for a stay said, I will agree that you can lengthen the 30-month stay, but whatever amount uh, it takes to do the IPR, but please stay the case, then I think a court would consider uh, consider doing that. Uh, Brian, any views on that? How many have you seen? Uh, they are I, really becoming common, uh, much more think, common in, in half-waxman cases. I think we're over 20 by now, but as to the stays of the hatch-waxman action pending an IPR, it also could prejudice the uh, the generic because I think if the generic were to ask for a stay under the provisions of the Hatch-Waxman action, it was quite possible that the 30-month stay would be required to be extended. Right. Uh, it, the two would seem to go hand in hand. Can I cite you a case off the top of my head? No, but when you if the generic is, in a sense is seeking a stay of the litigation, he's extending the time, and there are provisions in the Hatch-Waxman Act that deal with that, and I would think that, you know, the 30-month the stay would be similarly extended. But so then, even if the, uh, what happens could affect the ability of the generic to get the market. So it not only, it can cut both ways, depending upon the outcome, of course. Yeah. And there is one interesting case I will mention that's pending in front of Judge Samandel in New Jersey where a branded company has challenged the ability of a paragraph four filer to even file an IPR, saying that the under the Hatch-Waxman statute, a paragraph four is the functional equivalent of a declaratory judgment action, and those who file declaratory judgment actions are not permitted to file IPRs. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Um, if you'd like to stay on, we can. there's one more question that uh, was pending, we can stay on the line and answer it for those uh, who are interested. Um, I want to thank you uh, all for attending uh, our webinar. We'll post an on-demand uh, replay within 48 hours at fishlitigationblog.com. Uh, and if you have any questions regarding CLE credit, email Ellen at the email address on the screen, which is, I believe, uh, right there at the bottom, beneath the lovely pictures of myself and Brian. Uh, for those of you in New York, again, please make note of the course code 318 included on the New York CLE form that will be forwarded in a follow-up email. As a reminder, the code is only for New York attorneys because they have different requirements than other states. 
Finally, watch for our next webinar on the current landscape for NPE litigation, scheduled for 18, April 15th, and visit fishlitigationblog.com. Thank you. And we'll stay on the line to answer uh, the last question. Uh, for those of you who want to drop off, feel free. Uh, Brian, it's for you, and I'll, I'll just read it. Uh, it's, it's a long one. Um, if should have known is not the standard, then is there any objectivity required, i.e., can one defeat inducement with an objectively incorrect or even foolish but sincerely held belief of non-infringement or invalidity? A well, great question that I've often wondered. <laughs> I've often wondered. Uh, interestingly, if the... This only if, if decision is correct in that the patent is either invalid under Camille or not infringed under DSU, this question never arises because there's no liability, the patent's not infringed, patent's invalid. But if you have an opinion, and when this comes into play, the opinion is proven incorrect. Uh, there are not many cases, I think there's only one that I've read, and I've read, I think I've read them all, that discuss the merits of the opinion itself. There's one case that alludes to it, a district court decision. The judge very, very quickly goes over the contents of the opinion and says the opinion has, quote, the earmarks of reliability, unquote, and therefore it carries the day. When you look at how the judge described the opinion, at least to me, it didn't seem like there was anything special. There was no bells and whistles. It seemed like an opinion that anyone on the line would probably write, you know, on any day of the week if required. So there was nothing special. I haven't seen a case where the defense failed because the opinion was nonsense or, as the question says, foolish. Usually, as I said before, when the, the defense fails, it's due to timing. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully that answers the question. Yes, I hope so. And and I will just add one last comment, then we'll we'll ring off. Uh, I I I was going to give my hope that the Supreme Court will eliminate this intent requirement. It creates all sorts of, of mischief in the law. I had a case many years ago where uh, summary judgment of non-infringement was granted and then was reversed two years later. And we had to have an argument about whether or not there could be liability for inducement in the interim period during which the decision of the district court was in play, that there was no infringement, uh, versus the federal circuit reversal and said that the district court was wrong and that there was inducement of infringement. I think uh, any statutory rubric that's not specifically, uh, you know, so specific to make that um, state of the law actually in the statute, I hope they, I hope they get rid of it. Um, but I don't expect that they will. I think they'll go with the government's sort of middle-of-the-road position and will have an intent requirement on the infringement side but not on the validity side. Just Again, one comment you. on that, John, if I may. There are some cases, one in particular in the collection I have, that discusses uh, liability at different stages, uh, yeah. and it suggests that until the opinion, the written opinion, is in hand, it's a question of fact, whether it's a good faith belief, of course, once you have the opinion in hand, up until the time that uh, invalidity is found, I mean, validity is found or non-infringement is found depending, infringement is found depending upon the opinion, during that interim period, the cases suggest that there is no liability. Even, right. uh, obviously, that one point in time, the opinion is going to be proven wrong because the patent yeah. will be held valid and infringed. So, again, that shows the worth and the uh, significance of such opinions. And I don't disagree with John that hopefully the Supreme Court will do away with the entire good faith defense and adopt what seems to be the government's suggestion based upon the Supreme Court Arrow 2 decision, which you may want to read because that may be the wave of the future. All right, Brian, thank you very much, uh, and thank our audience again. For those of you that hung on for the last five minutes, we'll, we'll call it right here, and we hope to see you once again on uh, one of our, our later uh, webinars. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. This concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this